betrayed me first suspect Joe was that he knew more than any innocent person should have known. I suspected Irene the moment I heard the fireman's testimony. You have the unimportant facts. I suspected, I suspected Elaine the postman me. after he testified. I suspect. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. Listen to radio's newest, most interesting and thrilling program, Suspicion. Now, suspicion. Somewhere in the drama about to be presented is a seemingly unimportant fact, a hidden clue that first casts suspicion on the ultimate culprit. Listen regularly to this thrilling series, test your powers of observation and deduction, and find the hidden clue. It may be a single line, a sound, perhaps a complete scene. All names and characters depicted in this story are fictitious. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. In the story we presented last time in this series... Ransom, do you remember this scene? Trying to get some news about the kidnappers of Charles Edwards, Jr., Jim Croft of the Evening Journal went to the North Sea Cafe at half past two in the afternoon. While there, he spoke to Conrad Bliss. You're Conrad Bliss, aren't you? Uh, Yes. Have you been appointed go-between by the kidnappers? Yes. That scene, ladies and gentlemen, was the hidden clue. In Jim Croft's own words, What real kidnapper would meet a go-between in a fairly crowded cafe at half past two in the afternoon? It didn't make sense. That's why I suspected Conrad Bliss. Now we present Greed. London, England. Late on the afternoon of October 17th, Sir Basil Cathingway, barrister, addresses Irene Fields and Richard Morrow, niece and nephew of the late Howard St. John, in his office on Whitehall Street. And therefore, according to the documents you have just heard, the remainder of your late uncle's estate was divided equally between you, Miss Fields, and your cousin, Mr. Morrow. When will it be settled, Sir Basil? Miss Fields, I'm afraid that the will I have just read is... Well, it's worthless. Oh, what's that? I admired your uncle tremendously, Mr. Morrow, but I must admit that at times he was quite trying. Well, what do you mean? Merely that he often took matters into his own hands and as a result placed me in a position of not knowing exactly what to do. For example, one time... You mean he he may have written another will, Sir Basil? That it? Precisely. Only I'm positive that he did make another will. Oh. I received this letter from him a few days before his death. In part, he wrote, Due to the fact that certain information regarding my heirs has been proven, I am not going to destroy the will I drew up a year ago when I first learned that information. And he went on to say that the will is in his desk at St. John Manor. I say, Sir Basil... Uncle must have been a little batty. On the contrary, Mr. Morrow, he was... Uh, Now, see here. I don't know what sort of information he's talking about, but if it's anything criminal, it's quite absurd. Unless, of course, he referred to my cousin. How dare you say a thing like that, Richard? If the shoe fits, my dear... Oh, that will be all, if you don't mind. Now, and provided it's agreeable to both of you, all three of us will meet at St. John Manor this evening. And the first thing in the morning, we shall read his last will and testament. Is that satisfactory? Perfectly. Certainly. But I trust, my dear cousin, that you'll be polite enough not to arrive until after Sir Basil was there. Good evening, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, uh, hello, Marley. Have the others arrived? Yes, sir. They are waiting in the library for you. Good. Oh, um... I say, Morley, who arrived first? Miss Fields, sir. I see. Oh, uh, never mind. I can find my way. Very well, Mr. Morley. Sorry, I'm so late, Sir Basil. That's quite all right. However, I understand that my dear cousin made much better time down from London. Richard, if you're insinuating that my I'm doing... My dear, why not let the facts speak for themselves? I'm quite sure that Sir Basil and I agree that... It was love for St. John Manor that made you race down here. I might remark that you showed remarkably poor taste in such bickering. 
Shall we go into dinner? That garden, Claire. Shut up, you fool. Keep your eyes peeled while I slide down the rope. <coughs> Look out. You'll wake up everyone. Have you got it, Morrow? No. I must have been expecting something. Just as I was about to unlock the door, I noticed a wire on the frame. Some kind of burglar alarm. Blow me, but you're a soft and letting a blooming burglar alarm stop you. Forget it. Now listen. You see the window at the end of this wing? Your horse sees it. The desk is about three feet left of it, as I remember. Now wait until half past three, then break in. Yes, but what? Take every paper in the desk. Every single one. And where will you be, Governor, if you don't mind me asking? If anything happens, I'll see that there's enough confusion for you to get away. Yes, but suppose... It's the only thing. The one person we must look out for is my cousin. Sir Basil sleep through an explosion. But my cousin is probably wide awake. So be careful. Be careful not to make any noise, Jack. Don't worry about me, Irene. You watch your end. Remember that we're not the only people after that will. Morrow was going to try the door a few moments ago, but he saw the burglar along. Well, I'll take care of anyone that sticks his nose in. Of course you will, Jack, but take it easy. You know where the room is, don't you? Sure. Wait until half past three, then break in. Take everything. If you're seen, I'll see that you get away. Right. Whatever happens, watch out for my cousin. He's so crooked. He's likely to do anything. A few minutes after half past three, Morley the butler approaches the door of the late Howard St. John's study and presses his ear against the panel. For a moment he listens, then silently unlocks the door, opens it, steps into the room. Hands up. You stay where you are till I switch on the lights and see what happens. <laughs> Basil, I have some information I think you should know. Yes? It's about my cousin, Richard Morrow. Mm. About half past two this morning, I saw him sneak downstairs and try the door of this room. Perhaps he felt he was being watched, perhaps not. But at any rate, he suddenly stepped back from the door and returned to his room. I see. And might I ask what you were doing up at that hour, Miss Field? Well, I had a hunch he'd try to see the will first. If Uncle had left the estate to me, then my cousin would have destroyed it. Quite so. And the will is, to the best of my knowledge, missing. Oh, have you searched his room? Not yet, but come with me, please. Mr. Morrow? Yes, Sir Basil? Miss Fields has just informed me that she saw you by the door of the study at approximately half past two this morning. And what was she doing up at that hour? Did she or did she not see you? (laughs) Frankly, I don't know. I uh, did listen at the door for a moment, but... That's enough, Mr. Morrow. With your permission, I'm going to search your room. Go ahead. But you won't find the missing will. And by the way, Sir Basil, why not also pull the Sherlock Act in my dear cousin's room? Naturally. And you might be interested to know that for just an overnight stay, she thought it necessary to bring along a pair of slacks. (laughs) Are there any secret panels in this room, Morley? No, Sir Basil. I see. Well, then either Miss Fields or Mr. Morrow found a different hiding place for the will. No, quite so. Morley, just how much do you know about this affair? I beg your pardon. I happened to see a sudden change come over your face when I pulled this pair of slacks out of Miss Fields' suitcase. I think you're mistaken, Sir Basil. Morley, who did you see when you entered the study? Well, speak up. It was dark, sir. Yes, Basil. yes, you've told me it was dark and that you were struck from behind. But you saw someone, I know. Who was it? I... I'd rather not say, Sir Basil. You were quite attached to Mr. Howard St. John, weren't you? Oh, yes, sir. I might say we were a close friend. As close as the difference in our positions allowed, you understand. And do you realize that by refusing to tell me who you saw in the study, you were going against St. John's wishes? I see. I hadn't thought of that before, Sir Basil. Who was in the study when you entered? I... It was a very short person, Sir Basil. Not much taller than... than Miss Fields. Oh, and that fits in with the fact that she... I, I, I beg your pardon, Sir Basil, but it was a man. Eh? Oh, quite so. At least, 
I noticed that the person wore trousers, rather loose-fitting ones. That's why I feel certain that it wasn't Miss Fields, although the hands were quite small and shapely for a man. I see. Anything else, Morley? Uh, no, no. I didn't see anything else, Sir Basil. But what I did see was so confusing that I... I, I preferred not to say anything. A mistake might be quite embarrassing. Yes, and I'd rather not call in the police unless it's essential. Suppose we see the others now. I think I have the solution. So you brought a pair of slacks with you for an overnight stay, my dear. I suppose you take a formal evening gown on a cross-country... Oh, hike. shut up. Don't tell me the little girl is getting... Oh. One more wisecrack from you, I'll will you? your neck, you dirty little oh, swine. Oh, you... All right, say, what is this? Sir Basil, I refuse to stay here one hour longer if Richard Morrow makes any more remarks. The case remarks. is quite definitely settled, Miss Fields. Oh, well. <laughs> and who was the sleuth, Sir Basil? You or Morley? Frankly, both of us. If it's just because I have a pair of slacks with me, you're... A moment, quite... if you please. Take all the time you want. No need to rush the girl to jail. No, of course not. But first, I'd like to clear up, clear up a matter that seems to have thrown you and Miss Fields as well as myself off the right track. Oh? Obviously, St. John meant all persons who stood to inherit portions of his estate when he used the word heirs. He had known for several years, Mr. Morrow, that you and Miss Fields did, to a certain extent, associate with criminals. Certainly did. So what? Therefore, when he wrote about learning something about heirs, it seems reasonable that he had other persons in mind. Well, that's sensible. And among those persons, we find Thomas Morley, butler. Morley? Oh, I say, Sir Basil, that's absurd. Sir Basil is right, Mr. Morrow. What? You mean that you... Morley has made a full confession, how he pretended he was blackjacked by thumping his head against the wall. And here is the will. He had it with him all the time. And it's rather amusing to note that by stealing it, Morley cut himself off from an inheritance that would have made him quite a wealthy man. After hearing the terms of the will... And Morley was to receive the bulk of the estate because Uncle believed he had completely reformed. Precisely. Hmm? And he stole it because he feared he'd been given a smaller share. <laughs> but why did you suspect him, Sir Basil? You hadn't seen the will. Well, frankly, Miss Fields, I would have accused you and not suspected Morley except for one thing. It was that... Ladies and gentlemen... Did you discover the hidden clue that caused Sir Basil Cattingway to suspect Morley? Write into the station and tell us the hidden clue you found. And to check your powers of observation and deduction, listen for the correct hidden clue in this story the next time we present Suspicion. I suspected Irene the moment I heard the fireman's testimony. You have the unimportant fact. I suspected, I suspected Elaine, the postman after he testified. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. I suspected. Listen to radio's newest, most interesting, and thrilling program, Suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> 